Hello and welcome to episode 28 of The Final Whistle with myself, Nathan Sherritt, Martin Cassidy and Ant Canavan. Today we're absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, a psychotherapist, an author and a broadcaster, Gary Bloom, who is the author of this new book here, which for, for those who are watching or those who are listening, I should say, I'm holding up the book here, which is Keeping Your Head in the Game. And basically it's untold stories of the highs and lows of a life in sport and it details some of Gary's sessions where he goes into some depth and talks a lot about some of the challenges he's faced with multiple members of, of various sports across the spectrum. So welcome Gary, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me on this webcast. Welcome mate, lovely to have you on. It's funny, Thank you. one of the things that I um, I was quite keen to to think about quite early on was was the fact that when I've uh, read your book, or I've read certainly one, one or two bits that really stood out, one of the things that I thought was interesting and saw a parity between referees and, and therapists is you, you talk about buying time in sessions. And I, I always think that it's interesting because, you know, you talk about buying time to think about what you're going to say, how you're going to approach the situation. And I think referees do that quite often when, when they're refereeing a game, they might have seen a tackle and, and I know I do, maybe trying to replay it in their head before they make that final decision and commit to exactly what they're going to do. They might want to buy that time if they're at an elite level working with communications and hearing what the assistants have got to say before they come to a final decision. So I'm just quite interested in that concept of buying time and, and how it allows that thought process to develop. I think you touch very well, Nathan, on something called brain states. There's two large areas of our brain which are always fighting, fighting for control of us as human beings. And this is the limbic part of your brain, which is the emotional bit of the brain, the bits that uh, fear and anger and love and all those sort of big emotions that we we all um, endure at times sometimes they're very difficult to to get over and then there's another part of our brain which makes us human our, our domestic pets don't really have this bit of our brain this bit of the brain or it's a very very small bit of it and that is the prefrontal cortex so the relationship between the two is this that in the heat of the moment in the heat of the moment you might want to do something and then in a good way, if it's going very well, you will bring the computer online and think, is that really what is the most obvious outcome here? And then in good situations when it's highly emotive, you might think limbic response, limbic response, anger, frustration, excitement, and then we bring the computer brain, the brain online, the prefrontal cortex, and you might make a joint decision. I think that time that you talk about, Nathan, is the bringing online of this other bit of your brain when you can start to bring in other factors which might bring you to the right decision. Let me tell you how it, this works out in, in psychological experiments. Um, I've done this in schools myself, that if you, the prefrontal cortex, by the way, doesn't stop growing until the age of about 24 in women, 26 in men. So it's growing quite especially with young people, and obviously that takes in a lot of footballers, et cetera, et cetera. But with very, very young people, it isn't developed at all. Now, if you've got kids, try this experiment. So if you've got uh, a child and you say to them, Daddy is putting one cake on the plate in front of you, and I'm going to leave the room now. Daddy's going to leave the room. When I come back, if there is still one cake there, I'll give you another cake and you'll have two cakes. So a child whose prefrontal cortex is not developed and can't work out the logic around this, guys, guess what happens? Yep, you guessed it, you leave the room, you come back in, the cake is gone. And that's a good example of how the prefrontal cortex is not developed in young people. And I would say this idea of giving it a little bit of time is a chance for this, it's a bit like an app, to be honest, the app to come back online and a referee or an official can just think about all the wonderful things to make the right decision, not based on highly emotive situation, especially for the players screaming at him or her and trying to get them emotionally involved in a decision which might not be the wrong one. I'm just interested because one of the things that also came out in the book was, I think there was one situation or another where you spoke about, I would have done that, but I've done that before and it completely damaged the relationship. And, and I think that 
that's one of the key things that I find, particularly as, you know, as I recall the younger or earlier years of my refereeing career was with making big mistakes and losing control of the game, which I, I suppose is a little bit akin to, to obviously what you described there. I mean, this is something that I ask maybe quite a few people, but I'm more interested in your perspective, having read the book. Do you think that the mistakes that we make have a greater impact on us performing better going forward because the imprint, the imprint that it leaves is, is one that's significant? Um, it depends how you see mistakes, Nathan, because this is a really important bit for me. Olympic champion ice skaters are Olympic champion ice skaters because they've fallen on their backsides hundreds of times. Yeah. They've learned from those mistakes. So I think as an official to be able to say to a player, you know, I might have got that wrong, and I'm really sorry if I've got that wrong, but that's that's my decision, is more human than waving those protests away. Because once you say to somebody, you know, I could have got that wrong, what are they going to say after that? It chops people off right at the knees yeah. in terms of uh, them interacting with you. So I think it's really important for the referee to be able to say to the people he's refereeing, I could have got that wrong. I think what really infuriates, and I, you know, I played the game as a kid myself, what really infuriates me with the referee is that I'm not interested in what you have to say. I am above the law. Mm. I'm in charge. I don't care what you think. And mm. that's when you lose the game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then we've talked about this before to a, um, to a lesser extent. So it's great that we're covering this actually, because then we start getting to the realms of how many times you say you're wrong or you're sorry. And then, and then if you, we, we've discussed it with a young lad who was coming through and we said, look, communication is exactly that, is communication. It isn't one player constantly pestering you and, and trying to sort of coerce you into thinking like him. So we've said like, you know, if you do get something wrong and you do admit you're wrong, then, then good, we, we're totally with you and that. But you don't want to admit you're wrong every time you get challenged by a player. Well, I, I, would, I don't want to take exception with you here, Martin. I didn't say admitting you're wrong. Admitting you might have got it wrong is quite different. That's interesting. Explain that a bit more, mate. That's brilliant. Well, it's, it's the vulnerability that you as an individual could make mistakes. If I keep saying to you, yeah, I got that wrong. Yeah, I got that wrong. Yeah, I got that wrong. You're going to say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. But if I were then to say to you, do you know what, Martin, even in this broadcast today, or as a psychotherapist, as a broadcaster, I might occasionally get things wrong. That makes a different psychological relationship between you and I, or as a player and referee. The sense of vulnerability, which many people see as a terrible word, it's almost like a swear word. Vulnerability, sometimes uh, football players hear it as, well, that seems just weak. Yeah. I think it's a matter of strength to say, I'm, I'm going to do my best, but you know what? I might occasionally get things wrong. And afterwards, once the game is finished, let's have a conversation about it and tell me why you think I got it wrong. Because even as a psychotherapist, as an old geezer with you know, at my age with grey hair, I'm still learning. At times, I'm going to get things wrong. And my ability to say to my clients, I might have got this wrong, I think creates a, a sense of hum, a humanistic uh, bridge between you and that person yeah. because it allows them to get stuff stuff wrong themselves. And if you've got kids yourself, you'll know this, daddy might have got that wrong. Well, it actually allows the kid to make mistakes as well and say, well, if daddy can get things wrong, I can get things wrong. Yeah, I'm going to pull you up on that. It's not grey, it's magnolia. As a man who's got a <laughs> lot of magnolia hair, it's grey, not magnolia. <laughs> well, while we're on the we're on the subject of discussing hair, I'd just like to exclude myself from this because mine all migrated south uh, and I'm not qualified to talk about hair these days. <laughs> well, but you know there's a great saying in sport uh, Martin there's no substitute for class but experience comes a close second and I would say that to all referees who are watching this you know just just the miles and miles and miles of, of, of and hours and hours and hours that you do I think make you much much better at what you're doing and there's no, there's no substitute for that just keep doing it and you'll learn and then re go back and look at your mistakes, because you will make mistakes. Learn from your mistakes, and then push them aside and move forward. Because by reaching back into mistakes that you've made, you'll never move on. 
I know, and, and for people in football, all levels of football, when, when we go to football clubs and do our presentations, we do this thing where we, we write things in an envelope, we seal it before we start the discussion and we put it on a table. And then we talk to all the players and managers and we have a board and we say what you want from a referee. And it's always the same things. It's always talk to us, like you just said, which is really important. Admit when you're wrong, which is inverted commas, admit when you're wrong, uh, and get the big decisions right. That's what, and then consistency. So we know they're going to talk about this. They, We know what they want. They as in players and, and managers and everything. And we know what they want. We always argue. We'll always, even though we know what they want, they know what we want to do, we still fall out. It's that sort of package of like with consistency. They would want consistency. And I hate saying they, but players would, would want consistency. But then in a local derby on the first tackle, when they go right through the back of someone, they'll say, oh, come on, ref, it's only his first one. So it's having this sort of what is consistency. Well, Martin, you bring me on to a real hobby horse of mine about referees. Here we go. Let's light the blue touch paper and stand well back. But here we go. <laughs> this is my biggest beef about refereeing, that we have the rules of the game. But for lots of reasons, we choose not to apply them. And that's, that's, that's a choice that PGMOL decide to do or whatever. And ultimately, what you are describing, psychotherapeutically through my filter, is an unboundary process. What do I mean by unboundary? The rules are sometimes applied, they're sometimes not applied. I don't know whether they're going to be applied. They might be applied in different ways. The consistency that you are asked to uh, uh, impose on your matches, I'm afraid referees don't do. So here's my, th here's my th theory about it. If you had a kid and you kept threatening the kid, but you didn't go through with that threat, your threats become absolutely meaningless. Now, how would that work on a football pitch with a referee? There is a clear rule that foul and abusive language means a yellow or red card. It's as simple as that. That's a rule. How many referees actually impose that? And of course, you're going to say, oh, Gary, you know, foul and abusive language, you'd end up with three aside. It would only happen for a couple of weeks. Because I think if you were to impose that rule, and that boundary and said, you went into the dressing room before the game and said, look, foul abuse of language, it's, it's yellow card and red card, you're off, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe they think, oh, the referee's not serious, it ain't going to happen. And they swore at you or whatever, like they always do. It would only happen for a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We are not imposing the boundaries and they are imposed in very different ways, week in and week out. And if you did this and imposed those boundaries, you would end up with rugby-style refereeing, where the players respected the match official. Because actually what you're doing is getting the referee to take uh, all the responsibility for everything that goes on the pitch, but not really employing the power that goes with that. How does that work? Nobody wants responsibility without power. You go into any corporate organisation and say to somebody, I'm giving you all this responsibility but no power. Anybody in their right mind would say, sorry, I'm not doing that. But you're ref asking your referees to do it week in and week out. So how does that work? You've absolutely nailed it. There's literally nothing that you said just now that isn't absolutely spot on. And we've talked about this and it does need to take a short, sharp shock. Like you said, it'll happen for two, three weeks at the most. And then everyone will would, would ac accept this is the new status quo. This is now what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And like you said, the, the referees have almost been defanged. Yes, we've got these tools in our arsenal. We've got these yellow and red cards to control the, the abuse and, and the things to... to kind of let the players know, okay, yeah, you can talk to me like that, but it's going to come with consequences. We are encouraged, I think, as referees to be good referees by not sanctioning those players then for you're those... At fault, and you are at fault. 100%. And 100%. the problem is here, the problem is here, that if somebody from the Premier League was listening to this, they would say, suppose a, a referee, and, and referees reach out to me as a psychotherapist, that's my advice, if you did that and you had one of the top Premier League referees and uh, they sent off three Tottenham players, they'd be demoted. They'd course, say this yeah. guy is not, uh, not um, fit to, to, to referee a Premier League game and there'd be demotions. So you're asking your officials 
to go onto the pitches knowing that they can't effectively uh, impose the rules that they have been given to them. How on earth does that way? It's well, yeah, your, your referees will get punished. They get punished for applying so imagine, the letter of the law. In, imagine this, this. Imagine taking this model into a school. Can you imagine how there would be anarchy within five minutes? Well, the, the system we've got for referees in any other organisation would cause anarchy. And we say, what's the matter with the game and the refereeing of the game? Here it is. But yeah, no, it, it, this is the problem. And we've said this, re the, the reason it doesn't happen is it because it needs to be across the board, top down. There doesn't need to be a grassroots and hopefully it'll filter up in five years, in 10 years, because the players who are coming through the system have had the respect instilled at them at grassroots as their, their children and they get mm. to the Premier League. It doesn't work that way. It's got to sorry, be from the top down. Sorry, sorry, Anne. Did you say it has to be from the bottom to the top? Other way around. It needs to be top down. At the moment, what we've got is a grassroots initiative, a respect campaign that has been completely impotent because you've got, oh, we'll shake hands before the game. We'll line up. We'll, we'll let everyone know that we're super respectful. As soon as the referee blows that whistle to start the game, like you said, it's anarchy. People are calling you this. They're calling you that. And you're, you're encouraged to manage the game verbally by communicating with these players even though probably after the first offence they've overstepped the mark and could rightly be sent off but if if you are that one referee that starts throwing those cards out you're the one that everyone's like this is a bad referee in fact you're refereeing you're applying the letter of the law almost verbatim but because you're the only one doing it everyone's like oh we've got a we've got a, a by the book referee and that's not what we want to see we want to see common sense but we also want to see the letter of the law applied it's it's an horrible juxtaposition with no solution well there is a solution because i was speaking to a uh, a coach and a player coach today and he 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 said to me that when all the um uh, restructuring of the of the PFA happens, they will go to the PGMOL and say, we need to sort this out. We, our members want it sorting out, and therefore there has to be an organiser, there has to be a meeting between the PFA and the PGML, PGMOL, and hopefully we will get it. I tell you what really angers me, is if you do not attack this from the top, you get, it goes all the way down to the bottom, and your under nine games are going to be under nine players who are just mimicking what's going on, what they see on match of the day on, on a Saturday evening or on, on Sky. You have to start this process somewhere. Mm. Otherwise, it's going to eat the heart out of the game. And I, you know, as I can't think of a worse possible example. And kids learn by example. They just do. And if they see spitting and swearing and whatever at match officials at Premier League, EFL, league level, they're going to do it on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings on their park pitches. So it needs sorting out. I would, I, honestly, I, only because it wouldn't come across like that, I'd love to give you a round of applause. <laughs> I think you're right in it. And, and I had a blaze and now we're an ex-Premier League referee because he, 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 he said it was ridiculous and he always fought the corner that, no, no, we don't mimic. The, the Peter, Peter Cow's robot dance will be mimicked on every junior football pitch. Cruyff turn from years ago how did he find out about that in my local league you know, all of these things Ronaldo goal celebration are mimicked so football would be stupid to think that they would only mim mimic goal celebrations and not the behaviour on things they see on, on match of the day particularly with match of the day the, the, the desensitisation of refugees has been going on for decades absolute decades now, and we both got to take responsibilities for it. We can't just all lay it at the referees and say, oh, you know, the PGMOL have told referees not, not to deal with foul and abusive language. Well, let's get the players to stop using the foul and abusive language in the first place. We've all got to take ownership of it. And then when... Okay. Sorry, I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in, Martin. The, for people who might be at an amateur level, let's, let's, tell, let's name the elephant in the room here because there is an elephant in the room and it goes like this. Players believe that by challenging an official's decision, even if they know that official is completely right in that decision, they are beginning to influence the next yeah, one. True. And that's exactly what they're doing. They know when a foul is a foul, yeah. but by screaming at the fourth official, screaming at the referee, they believe there is a psychological advantage to be had 
the next time the referee has to give a marginal decision. So let's not let's let's be honest about this. There is method in their madness. Absolutely. And we have to stamp that out. And the problem is you have a race to the bottom whose behavior becomes the worst. So that if, think, if, if team A are thinking, well, team B are doing that, we've got to do it as well. And the more we do it, the other team are going to do it. So then you end up with a, um, a, a spiraling down of behavior, which is then mimicked through all our young players. That can't be right. I, I, no, I get, I abs- I'm, I'm with you. So 98% I'm with you on it. Tell and me about the 2%. Come on. 2%. Draw, draw, draw up a chair in my therapy room. Okay, and let me, my, my 2% is this, is that um, it's the external influences of the environment of the game with regards to there's, there's far more external influences when you get to the Premier League because you've got TV, you've got multi-million pound players that they've got to man- manage. Whether we like it or not, that's going to have a psychological impact on you as an individual who's just a poor old referee send the next players who are in a money per week that you'll probably never earn in your lifetime. That's an external influence. Then down, lower down, why referees won't address it, in, in my opinion, before we even start talking about assessors and observers, is because they would believe, and they've been conditioned, that if they don't send off a found abuse of language, if they don't caution for the odd challenge, like that it's only his first one, they'll get a better club mark it's that external influence that makes them, or the consequences of me doing my job, is that I will not get promoted. I will not get that county cup final. I will not get that big local derby that everybody wants on, on Boxing Day. So I think we need to just recognise that the external influences isn't just a referee saying, I've been told not to deal with that, so therefore I'm not going to deal with it. And I think that's the 2% when I'm thinking, yeah, I'm with you. We do need to take ownership. And it is we do get influenced. We, we, we've had managers on here who said, Scouts, I was quiet in a game because you told me to. And then I realised that the other manager was totally influencing them. And then I had to do it to get the same influence. So you are absolutely right. But we've got to be aware of the external influences that affect those decisions not to address law. But if you were to take a, a decision on a much higher level here, Martin, and the PGMOL said, look, we, we know we're going to have to redraw our, our thoughts and we're going to get together with PFA and come up with a joint plan. All that in external uh, assessing and influencing would disappear. Yes, because I- a, new, a new way. And you know what? Football referees would turn into rugby referees virtually overnight. Mm. You do not hear that on a, rugby, on a rugby pitch. And if you think about you know, some of the best referees in the world, the Nigel Owens, the rugby referee, you know? He Absolutely. owns that rugby pitch, and you're not going to argue with him. No, but if and he did, you'd be off. Well, also, he, also, he, also, he, also, he went so far as to say, famously, "This is yeah. not soccer." Yeah. No, we what did, does yeah. that tell you? So, um, look, you're asking a psychologist here, not not a football referee. You know more about football refereeing than I'm ever going to know. This is my. If you're asking me how to fix a broken problem in any situation, guys be it in your family, in the plate, your place of work, in the schools, if there is issues around behaviour, you always look at the boundaries of the system. Hmm. And if the boundaries of the system are not right, you will get those infractions. And I'm saying this is especially true in refereeing, which needs to take a long, hard look at itself and drag the PFA around the table and if the, if the players agree the code of conduct and the referees agree the code of conduct, this would disappear overnight because any football manager who sees his players sent off week after week after week is not going to pick him. Mm. It's a liability. But then the other external influence for people not taking control of it, in my opinion, is that what business would want to stem an income stream? Now, County FA is on the FA make a lot of money out of yellow and red cards. They get, each a player will get fined, the money goes to the county FA or the FA, the player doesn't get any benevolence from that. So it doesn't make business sense for a referee to get on with a player from the FA side, from the county FA side, because there's a monetary is it income stream there. And, and whether we like it or not, they're all businesses, limited companies, etc. So that's one of the external influences, I think, that will not influence the county FA to go, do you know what, we're going to do something else. There might be a peak in it, like you said, and all the referees will get accused of saying, ah, you're just making more money for the county FA. It's this sort of cohesive, like you said about the PFA, I believe the PFA 
and the influence that they could have down at lower levels where these glass loose clubs who can't afford to play I've got those players who are getting sent off every week getting fined so if they refuse to pay as a player the club gets the fine the club get, might get you know signed off not to play so I think there's lots of there is lots of little little um, outside influences that, that prevents people addressing it like you and us want it to be addressed but actually what you're arguing if you don't mind me saying so much it is the financial constraints against the ethics what's more yeah. important absolutely but you it, well it depends who you talk to well, yeah, really <laughs> well there's, there's no doubt in my mind and you, you know you're talking to a psychotherapist that you know to me ethics is, is everything and if you want an ethical mm. to me ethical organizations make money eventually yeah what you're saying martin this is it, to me if i were to rearrange your words is Gary, this is going to hurt and it's going to bloody sting. Yeah, but it's only going to sting for a short period of time. And then we go back, to, we go on to something much, much better. But if we had the perfect relationship between players and referees and there was no money going towards the county FA or the FA for any of that misbehaviour, even if a referee punch gets punched and he's in a hospital hospital, if a player gets fined for that, the referee doesn't get any of that benevolence, no money. Stays with the FA. And I've said before, I've put it on record, the only other organisation I know that makes money out of violence is the Mafia. And I don't know how a business can form an income stream, a significant income stream, that is purely on money. If you want to address it, take points off teams. You can get you can get prevented from being promoted within the football system as a club. If your changing rooms aren't the right size, that's, the, that's documented. If, if you had a terrible discipline record, the worst in the country... It's irrelevant, you'll still go up if, you're, if your facility is the right size. So again, it's that external influence to people to address it properly. If you can stop someone going up because their facilities are not the same size, then stop them going up because the behaviour is so poor. There's a great saying in my world that, you know, it's very hard for somebody to look at their own behaviour when their salaries depend on them not looking at their own <laughs> Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm quite interested, uh, Gary, in, in obviously we touched on it right in the introduction about obviously the book that you've now got out, the fact that you're a broadcaster and and obviously, you, you know, you've got the psychotherapy, which is obviously the, the subject matter of the book. How easy or difficult is it for you to to wear different hats, so to speak, to to switch from one occupation to another almost? Um. The truth is that 99.9% .9 of my work now is psychotherapeutic. Um, jumping out of that and being, a, being a, an author is, is, is quite tough. Um, but, you know, I, I think people these days wear lots of different hats. You can be a dad and you can be a son and you can be a, you know, and somebody's friend and you can play golf with your friends one day and be a, having a beer in the pub, hopefully when the lockdown ends another time so I think I think these days it's much more normal to be doing different things I mean my our parents and our grandparents generation they had one jobs one job for life you know people have many careers these days so I think I'm um, I'm hopefully showing that you know I spent many many years as the man who shouted gold for a living and that's something that's that I decided to do something differently but I do decided to do something differently so I know I, but I was worried. I often thought, blimey neck, I wonder what my, my, my broadcast colleagues will think of me turning into a psychotherapist and becoming the only sports psychotherapist um, working in first-team football. But eventually you get to the point where I just think I don't, I don't really care. I mean, I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. It seems to be working. Mm. Why not? It just it seems to me that, you know, one of the things that, that you've really got is... I, I, I'm guessing you've got almost a reputation because one of the things that you, well, in fact, you opened the book with it, didn't you? You know, I think was it Steve Wilson who was con commentating on a game and, and Steve then said, Oh, look, there's, there's Gary Bloom. And, you know, obviously he knew you as a media colleague probably more than in your other role, but it seemed to me that, you know, almost you've got this, maybe even there's players and, and managers now who, maybe we're operating as players and are now involved in the coaching side who knew you as a broadcaster and now maybe are inviting people because I know, look, reading the book, a lot of managers are referring players and staff to you, you know, knowing you in different ways. Yes, it does work that way. Um, 
it's also different generations. So, you know, young, young youngsters in their 20s, late teens, seniors, maybe know me as a, as a sports psychotherapist, older ones might remember me commentating on Football Italia and, and, and Sky and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that the benefit for me is when it comes to things like this, I am able to broadcast and I come from a broadcasting background. So hopefully, and I stress the word hopefully, I can explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. My journalistic background allows me to write a book. I think that is the main benefit that to explain what you're doing as a psychotherapist because of your broad broadcasting background might give you a little bit more power. But that that's about it. I know, I know that you talked about catching clients on the television from time to time and things like that. But one of the things that I was quite keen to ask you was, does that insight and that first-hand sort of knowledge of being in those environments as a commentator enhance that now that you're going into the sports psychotherapy? Because a lot of your colleagues in psychotherapy won't have that level of, you know, almost having been on the call face, so to speak, you know, sat in the ground at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Whereas when you're working with a, with a Premier League footballer, you know exactly what it's like when that first whistle blows. Not to play, but you understand the environment, you understand the pressures in the, of that situation. Because obviously one of the things you talked about in the Angus segment of the book was about managers shouting at officials and I think you used the line, if you've ever been to any game, you'll know that this happens. So I think that, that you know, obviously, you if, certainly for the book, you've drawn from experiences of being in that environment and that atmosphere. Well, hopefully that's pushed my career on. It's kind of you to say so, Nathan. Thank you. Yes, I think the, the psychotherapist in the dressing room is not just the psychotherapist in the dressing room. It's the psychotherapist who's been hanging outside dressing rooms for 30 years knows players, knows managers, knows what goes on on the training ground. And maybe that's given me a, an edge when I've walked into football clubs or worked with players. Um, but it's really hard when you see one of your clients playing on TV not to jump up and down when they score a goal because you've talked to them about that very thing that week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, they have a really difficult game and think, oh, blimey, neck. am I really that good at my job? Maybe I need a bit more training or whatever. So... You get the highs and you get the lows as well. Do you do you do much work on um, a captain? As a captain, it's a very different role in football with a team. And what we said in the past is sometimes if you've got a really uh, high maintenance manager um, captain as a referee, you know it's handy if that captain isn't in the middle of the park where you can't escape him. It'd be nice if he was a white back so you could escape him as a referee and have a have, have a, a rest of all the shenanigans. Would you would you sort of talk to teams about you know the role of a captain in regards to how he would sort of affect not just the match and his teammates but the match official too? Well, uh, I'll just tell you this privately between you and I, Martin. <laughs> but there's um, the truth is that every football club has roughly three captains. Uh, there's three roles inside every football club. Uh, and just because somebody's wearing the armband, as you will know, and anybody who's refereed the game doesn't mean so that the captain. Okay, technically the captain. So the three roles are this. There's the leader by example. Um, so you would have somebody who's the best player in the team, the David Beckham kind of figure captain. Then we have the shouter and baller, the one who screams and shouts, the Roy Keane kind of figure who's uh, never going to make sure anybody does not come off it during the football match, that's another type of captain. And the third type of captain is the social captain, the people, the person who organises all the socialisation of the players inside the group. So to, call, to talk about a captain of a football club or a football team, I think is maybe, it's a bit deeper than that, if you don't mind me saying so, no. because there are diff different roles. And you might find uh, one person does two of those roles, and then one person does the other. But they found out that when you talk about these three separate role, roles, there is one sport which dominates that, where nearly always you have three people. And would you believe that's handball? Uh, don't ask me why that is. But handball is, is the one sport where you would have those three roles. With football, you usually have one player operating in two of those roles and another person being in the third role. Wow. We never, ever have thought of framing it that way. Not a million years. Well, you invite the psychotherapist on the <laughs> <laughs> Job done, job done. 
So do you do anything on body language and facial expressions? Do, do would you, from a match official's point of view, I think it's the most undervalued skill of a match official is, is your body language and your facial expressions and the visual impact of it. Is, does that work with, a, with players too? Yes. Uh, there's lots of times um, that I will say to a player, look at your body language, because psychology is all about perception. It's all about how people perceive you. And there was... Um, there was a really interesting experiment about uh, how muggers chose their victims. Oh, really? Uh, and they they did a whole psychological experiment on this. And the the people who the muggers were looking at for the right profile of people who they thought they could intimidate. So I'd say to this to any match official: if you go out onto the pitch excuse me, with your chest back and your shoulders out, you're less likely to be intimidated than if you are shoulders are slumped and you're looking at the ground and you don't make eye contact. Because when you make eye contact with somebody, it is a very, very strong message. It really is don't mess with me, especially if that's the, the expression, but it can mean a whole bunch of other things as well. So eye contact is huge. And also, where are you looking? And I often say to my centre forward, I'm working with a, a centre forward at the moment, and I said, generally during a game, where do you look? And he says, I look at the ground. I said, stop looking at the ground. Look at your centre half in the eye and know the next time the ball is coming up to you, he's going to have a battle with you. Pin your shoulders right back, your chest out, and then you make yourself a bigger target man for your you know, players in your own team. But body language is huge. It says a lot about you. And I repeat, the, the, I said right at the start of the answer, psychology is all about perception, how people perceive you. If it's true or not, it's another matter, but it's how you're perceived. Just, just to follow up really on that, Gary, you know, obviously I've read the book and the clinical notes section when you introduce a new case study to us is something that, that fascinates me. And probably the bit that fascinates me most amongst that is the whole appearance section that you, you do where, you know, I know that maybe that's also partially for us as a, a reader to build maybe a picture of that individual in our minds. But if you don't mind me saying it, it's almost like a Sherlock Holmes style deduction that, that you seem to do when you when you meet and begin with a new client. And I, that's kind of one of the things that I was going to ask in relation to that appearance. You know, I heard once that we form opinions about people from the first 30 seconds of of meeting them. And, and I wondered if that was the, I mean, I know that probably you're a little bit more educated and a little bit more open-minded than to do such a thing, but I think, you know, clearly it does form a, a real impression for you in, in terms of the way that you write it, because it, it seems that you, you read into, into what you see, you know, particularly when they maybe wore a tracksuit in the first session and then they come very well dressed for the second session. I think, um, I, I think it was, Einstein, if somebody said to him, what do you think your skill is? And he said, I don't think I've really got a skill, but I'm passionately curious about everything. And I'd like to think of my saying that if I can look at you and there's a clock behind you, I'm thinking, what does that mean? I'm looking at Martin and there's a piece of art which has got music orientated behind him. I'm thinking, what does that mean? I'm looking at Anthony's the only one pair wearing a pair of headphones, so I'm wondering what that means in the technicality of the person recording this. So those are ideas that are swimming around my head. Now, that particular thing isn't that tuned in because of what we're doing, but if I was working with any of you as my clients, I'd be looking at that and says, what does that music picture say? What do they, what's the headphones saying? What is the clock behind you saying? So that's kind of important all the time because a client will only give you what comes out of his mouth. There's a great joke, you know, which um, which goes like this. What, um, and it ha has happened to me um, when people say, oh, you're a psychotherapist, can you read my thoughts? And I said, my stock answer is only when you open your mouth. And that's, <laughs> that's the thing. So only what people say is, is, a, is an important bit of the, the material. But the rest is how they're dressed, what they look like on a Zoom call, what's behind them. What do you want me to see? And it's interesting. This is my therapy chair. I deliberately make sure nobody sees anything because all that information means something maybe unconsciously to the person looking at it. And when you get dressed in the morning to deliver a session, do you think about your outfits? And, and what I do. 
Yeah, so I tried to be as neutral as possible. So if I had a a big Man- Manchester United, uh, mm. not that I support Man United because I'm a Leeds fan and I would never wear anything Man United orientated, <laughs> but if I had a big Leeds you know, crest on there, you're automatically giving information to the people that you're that you're you're working with. So yes, you're going to make assumptions about me based on my cheesecloth style shirt or the colour of my hair or my glasses. Of course that, but suppose I hadn't been shaved I hadn't shaved this morning, or I'd come with dirty clothes or I was very sportily dressed, you'd be making assumptions about that from the get-go. Yeah. It's, uh, I, it's so important. I, I remember seeing a guy get out of a car or a football ground on the way to a game. I t- travel separately as his coach. And as soon as he got out of the car, he had his tie, well, he was starting to put his tie on. He was like, that's stretching. It's all me back. Stretching. And I, I clocked him and I said to him afterwards, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you just stop around the corner? Maybe out at Sainsbury's or the, there are other super, supermarkets brands, obviously, at Tesco's or whatever. Go and do that there. So when you get it out of your car, you open the car, you're ready, you don't have to worry about stressing your tyres on. Those little things, because you don't know who's watching you, particularly at the lower levels, where you know the guy who's doing the car park could be the the father of the, of the, of the chairman or the player, and everything's connected where you're always sending out signals. Just make sure those signals are positive. Yeah, so I was, was, I was once working with a player at a football club, and he said that the gaffer doesn't like me, just doesn't like me, can't get in the first team, can't get on the bench. And I said, what happens when you go into the football club at the moment? He goes, oh, I've got a face like a slap behind, not happy, just really unhappy with what I am. I said, do you ever ask anybody how they are, how their kids are? How... No, nah, can't be bothered. I said, all right, let's, ch- let's, let's have an experiment. When you go into the training ground on Monday, you go up to the gaffer, ask him how his missus is, how his kids are, have his, has he had a good weekend? Big smile on your face, shoulders back, chest out, talk to your colleagues, ask them a few personal questions. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Within two weeks, he was back in the first team. So I said, well, what happened? He says, nothing. He says, I'm training exactly the same. He says, I'm doing nothing different. He says, I just feel a bit more confident. But the perception about him, Martin, inside that football club had changed. I spoke to the manager and he said, don't you have done with that player? He's a different player. Wow. <laughs> wow. Really it's really interesting, isn't it, when we talk about the communication side of things? Because one of the things I've noticed from listening to your podcast and, and reading your book is that you are, you, well, to, certainly my perception of you as a, as a communicator is that you're a pretty straight shooter in terms of when something needs to be said, it's said, um, and you do the best for your clients in terms of, you know, maybe cutting through some of the bluster in order to, to make progress. And I'm, I'm quite interested in that sort of that direct style because I feel that for referees, sometimes they may f- subconsciously even fear the consequences of an action that they, that they are going to take and maybe overthink that. And, and, and that's why kind of, you know, using what I described there and obviously thinking about it from a refereeing perspective, is that something that you had to work on, you know, to become yeah. a more direct person? Yeah, it's, it's part of my process of training to be a therapist and also my own therapy. Um, it's called radical candor. Um, and that radical candor can be delivered very, very kindly. It doesn't have to be aggressively delivered. It doesn't have to be uh, unkindly delivered, but it's a directness that you know that I respect you enough that I will be honest with you. I won't be unkind with you, but I will tell you exactly what I think. I won't offer you advice because that turns you into a child. I won't uh, wave my finger at you, but I'll say, look, I'm prepared to share my thinking with you and dot, dot, dot. And people respect that. And if they don't respect that, well, maybe I'm not for them. And knowing that that is okay for them and me is fine. But radical candor is always in the back of my mind when I'm working with people. You've got to be careful sometimes. You know, people who've had traumatic incidents in their lives, you can't go blundering. You know, I've, I've, I'm working with a client at the moment, a non-sporting client who's suffering from PTSD. Um, and I can't, the golden rule about PTSD is don't go straight in and ask about the incident. Yeah. So we're gently going towards it. But he's in... The guy is unstitching his life to me and we're finding out more about each other. But radical candor, I think, is a good phrase to pass on to your referees about being honest with somebody and saying, look, I don't know whether I'm right, but it looked like a free kick. I think it's there. Would you please retreat 10 yards? 
um, and see what happens. Just be honest with people. And if people say, well, you've made a mistake, show me a football player on any pitch that's never made a mistake. Yeah. Referees uh, make mistakes. Too. Rad- radical candor, as you've just described it, is almost the exact opposite of what some referees do when they make a decision and then shoo people away. Mm-hmm. They don't want criticism. They, they don't want advice or anything like that. But having that, as you say, radical candor to say, I've, uh, this is what I think I've seen and this is the decision based on that. I, like you say, it humanizes the referees. And I think in this era and this, this, you know, environment that we've got at the moment where we've, we spoke about it, the, the heart of football, it's, it's beating slower and slower because it's getting killed off by referees not enforcing what they should be doing with regards to maybe discipline and players cheating and diving and screaming over the, the, the faintest little touch. Maybe it's time that football as a whole has a little bit of radical candor with itself. And like you say, it's got to be from the top down because I would love, love for some sort of systemic fundamental change to to bring the game. Uh, Because we all know it, we all love it, and we all want it to be the best it can be. Let me tell you a story, guys. I know we're coming to the end shortly, but let me tell you a story. I went to commentate on a a U20 World Cup in South America. Sounds uh, it sounds rather glamorous, but I can assure you the hotels we're staying in were anything but glamorous. <laughs> and I'm there sitting, having my you know my very very modest um, chicken and chips as my pre-match meal. And I'm sitting on my own, and and, and a guy comes down stairs uh, and sits alongside me. He says, "Can I join you?" And the whole hotel had been empty because um, everybody had gone off to the ground to set up for the game. And I said, hi, I'm Gary. Uh, I'm the match commentator, but I'm also a psychotherapist. Because that's really interesting. He said, I'm the match referee tonight. And I said, oh, I never really get a chance to talk to the referee. You know, this is a FIFA referee. He came from Scandinavia. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, you know what? What's really killing me? He said, this is an under-20 World Cup. Um, you know, sometimes I think the referees are really hard on players who are doing their best, but they're very young and they're learning. Uh, and I said, sometimes it just needs a, a quiet word and a better way of, you know, saying to young people, just be careful. You know, a yellow or red card after 10 minutes, because that's the rule. Uh, you know, I'm talking about for a foul. I'm not talking about abusive language. You know, one of those 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 incidents where the referee starts showing their yellow cards. Is, I said, they're kids. These are kids. They're learning. Give them a chance. So he, he, you know, he, you know, in that sort of Scandinavian way, <laughs> he thought about what I'd said. I thought, oh well, you know. And then we went away, and I, he went away to prepare. I went to the game, sit down, and ten minutes in, this is uh, a, South, uh, a Central American country and a, a European country, and two lads smash into each other for a 50-50 ball. It was one of those things that could have been in a Tom and Jerry cartoon. It was like your know, limbs everywhere. And I thought, <laughs> oh. It was one of those, it could be two reds. It could easily have been two reds. And the referee, bless him, he got these two lads rolling around like, the, you know, they're, they're in terrible agony. And the referee stooped down and got each boy to his feet, held, pulled him up, pulled the other lad up, and he said, right, shake hands. And they did. And he said, right, let's get on with it. And I thought, I just wonder, you know, how that <laughs> be thinking, I wonder if that little conversation yeah. over lunch has produced what I would call a humanistic touch to two lads who are desperate to do well for their countries, but were very, very young in the opening stage of that international game. I think that's a, a great place to end and to remind the listeners and viewers that they can get your book, Keeping the Head in the Game, uh, Keeping Your Head in the Game, I should say, um, from all sort of, usual outlets thanks we'll, very much we'll put we'll put a link in in the comments in the description wherever you're watching or listening to this there'll be a direct link so you can go out there and get gary's book and cool. martin and nathan it's been a real privilege thank you so much for inviting me on thanks thank very much you, gary man. and for all our watchers listeners thank you very much and we'll see you on the next episode bye bye